Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th. We got more AMAs today. This is really interesting to me, the, the varied uh, types of questions, the questions themselves, what part of what my life is all about, um, and my relationship with my viewers and my students and my, my clients, uh, these cover is just fascinating. So let's get right into it. Um, this is the fourth of a series uh, where I ask people to ask me anything, and here are some of the questions they asked, and here are my answers. Uh, David, I'm not currently a sag after member, but was years ago, and vaguely recall a rule stating voice actors cannot have more than one commercial within the same genre airing at the same time. Can you expound on any such or similar rule and explain if it would also apply to non-union work as well? So um, what you're talking about is conflicts, and that's not a union rule. The union, by design, wants you to have as much work as you possibly can have. They're not concerned about uh, conflicts at all. It's a rule within casting offices and advertisers. They want you to tell them. If you have a spot running, like say you're doing a spot for McDonald's, uh, the people at Burger King want to know that. And that's why on resumes, you'll see the phrase conflicts available upon request uh, rather than a list of <clears throat> different uh, different commercials that have been done. Um, and it's the same for non-union. It has no different, it's no different between union and non-union work. It's not a union rule. It's not a non-union rule. It's a tradition and something that you need to disclose to advertisers. I, I watched somebody, I was in a series a few years ago that was sponsored solely by Subway. And I watched someone who was in that series, a lead in that series, get written out because he accepted a commercial uh, from McDonald's. Uh, and his agent didn't think that the the web series we were doing was going to have any legs. It turned out it had what, four or five seasons? It was great. Um, and the McDonald's spot ran one cycle of 13 weeks. So that's it's called conflicts. There's no union rule on that. So great question. Thanks for asking. Um, how do you, David, direct yourself when doing a voiceover? So that to me is one of the like gold standard things that I teach in Vio to Go Go. We have a class on, a whole class uh, in the Via to Go curriculum very early on called Mastering the Art of Self-Direction. And it's a brilliant question, and it's the same question I asked myself. I'm like, wow. So more often than not, I'm not going to, and now almost never, go to a studio to do my audition work where I get feedback, maybe from a casting director, maybe from an engineer who is tasked with a casting entity to get a certain type of read. Now I'm just sitting here in, you know, Mikasa, uh, and I'm kind of by myself. I'm kind of isolated, and I know that it's the same for you. And so what I did was I took a series of, uh, of methods that allow you to analyze what you're doing, where you are in the story, what your role is, what the job is that you're trying to help the listener achieve. And I have a particular path when I, it's all integrated with uh, learning how to voice commercials. I have a particularly specialized path that deals with finding the secret in a commercial, in, in the copy, revealing that secret so that the listener can get their job done. Because every piece of copy that is written um, has a particular purpose, has a particular function. Uh, either they want to uh, help you understand why using their product or service is better than using their competitors, or using their product or service is better than not doing anything at all, uh, or what could happen if you don't use their product or service. And that's just with commercials. Uh, with other categories, uh, to me, it boils down to storytelling. When I listen back to things, and I rarely do these days, I have faith that I'm able to do uh, what I'm able to do and and do so fairly consistently. But when I do listen back to stuff, I listen the same way I listen to my clients. Am I wrapped up in my story? Not, oh, I wish I'd done that, or I wish I'd changed that, or I wish I'd go in that direction. 
So for me, it's being subsumed by the story itself. And that's true for any category of work. When you can accomplish that, you're well on your way to being able to direct yourself and to uh, take, you know, sort of make up for the fact that there's no casting entity or director or engineer or producer there to say, yeah, can we get a little bit more snappy with that? You know, can you talk to a bigger room? Things like that. We give you all the tools that you need to do that work in that class called Mastering the Art of Self-Direction. It's very important and it's a great question to ask. Um, okay, one last one, sure. I wonder if you might be able to elaborate, David, some on the crossover from being trained as an on-air talent to commercial voiceover. Oh, oh, what a great, what a great question. Many years ago, I would take VO boot camps and classes and the first thing I'd get asked is, do you work in radio? I guess it's something with cadences or so I've been told. Well, it's actually with the placement of the voice, usually. Um, the, the, the depth, the deepness of the voice, the pitch of the voice, and where it is in your mouth. Is it further back? Is Are you back here when you're talking? Are you doing the radio thing where you're kind of doing the pukey thing? Uh, or is it more naturally up front? Um, also a little over enunciation. There's a lot of things that we pick up in terms of habits when we work in radio. We hear people, at least when I was growing up, I heard DJs that I thought were just really the bee's knees. And by doing that, I just completely became my grandfather by saying that phrase. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to be, you know, John Lanigan, the real Bob James. I wanted to be Don Imus. I wanted to be Rick Dees. These were all people... You know, Dan Ingram, um, George Michael, not the singer George Michael, but the DJ on WABC in New York, 77 WABC. Um, these were people that had a particular style that was genre specific. It was radio specific. And sometimes you just have more resonance in your voice and people assume that you developed it because you were on the air. Uh, it's It's tough. And... Part of my job, again, when I'm working with my clients, is to stamp out some of that. You know, you should celebrate however your voice turned out. You should celebrate however it's developed from a child to a, to a teen to an adult and what the work that you've done has done to develop that as well. Executives develop a particular type of voice. Attorneys develop a particular type of voice. Teachers develop, uh, you know, um, what else? Engineers, I guess, develop a different kind of voice. Everybody has moms. Moms develop a particular kind. David, um, everybody has these, these things that happen in their environment that lead them down a certain path with the development of their voice, not the least of which is the family they grew up with. I can tell pretty much right away whether someone was an only child, because they take as much time as they want with when they speak, or someone grew up in a large family where getting a word in edgewise was tough. And, you know, there's things about radio, having been in radio for a long time, I can recognize as well. And that radio voice can either be a blessing or a curse. I'm pretty sure that I got a lot of work in ADR because I had an announcery voice, and I could imitate some of the uh, prototypical announcer stuff like promo announcers and DJs and sports play-by-play -play guys and color commentators. Um, so they probably recognized something in your voice like that and was just calling it out. Uh, but when it happens in a VO class, it's because the voiceover teacher wants you to be more realistic. They want you to tell that story. Uh, to not rely on those DJ chops to have a great voice, but to actually connect with an audience. You know, DJs don't necessarily do that. They speak to a talk show host, DJs. They speak to a different audience, and, and consultants in radio constantly try to get them to stop doing that. Um, but that, that false tone is something that is inherent in a lot of former radio personalities, me included, until uh, you learn that just being you makes all the difference in the world. What a great, uh, what a great question. Thank you so much. And I keep saying what a great question 
because they almost all were. There were there were there were only one or two questions that I thought, is this a joke? And I'm still considering whether to answer them. So we'll let you know. I got more. I got more. I got more. <laughs> Hopefully you're not getting tired of this because we got a lot more. Uh, ask me anything. This was the fourth in a series. Um, and I'll do another one tomorrow and we'll see how far we can get. Maybe I can wrap it up, but you know, I'm not going to do it until I'm, I'm done. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to my YouTube channel, well, go ahead and click on my head there. If there's no head, there's a subscribe button somewhere below this video. If you want to see the latest episode that I've done, go ahead and click on that frame there and YouTube will play it for you. I'm David H. Lawrence, the 17th. I thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you tomorrow.